Welcome back to 13C everyone. Today, we're taking a look at the Beretta ARX100. This is a pretty cool little rifle, if not a little odd looking. This is the civilian version, semi-auto version, of the Beretta ARX160. This ri the rifle was originally designed for the Italian military and there's some carryover in these designs that make their way into this rifle. So if there's a couple peculiarities about it, it's probably why. Today we're gonna go over some of the things I like about it, some of the things I dislike, and some of the reasons why this may or may not be a good choice for you. Some of the great features about this rifle is the fact that it is completely ambidextrous. You have a magazine release on both sides, you have a bolt release on both sides, you have a safety on both sides, you have identical sling mounting points on each side, as well as the ability to change the charging handle without breaking the rifle down from one side to the other, which I'll show you in a minute when we break this down, as well as being able to change the side the bullet ejects on without breaking apart the rifle, changing out the bolt, or hardly doing anything to it. So as you've seen early, earlier, it's been ejecting out the right side all day. I'll go ahead and confirm that again right now. As you saw, went out the right hand side. Now with the tip of a bullet, simply push that in. And now it's gonna be ejecting out the left side of the rifle. That's pretty cool. With the exception of the Aimpoint Pro, the Beretta ARX100 comes with everything you see pictured. From the cardboard box, the instruction manual, warranty card, the rifle itself, backup iron sights, 30 round magazine, the sling with your quick release feature, as well as the case itself here in the background. That's a pretty nice padded case and is really nice to see included with this package rather than just having another box inside the outer shipping box. They actually have that nice padded case inside there which is pretty useful and it is important to note that with that Aimpoint Pro on there it will fit, still fit inside and zip up nice and tight. So this rifle is in no way meant to be a tack driver. This is a copy, as I said earlier, of the ARX160, the Italian uh, battle service rifle. So this is going to have those standard ranges of acceptability for accuracy, which for the most part is gonna be about two inches at 100 yards, maybe since I'm using this Wolf here right now, maybe about two and a half inches. Shot this in a carbine class the other weekend. I zeroed it at 50, we're back out at 50 right now. We're gonna give it a go here and see, uh, see if we're still on target and then we'll push it out to the 100 yard range. head down and take a look. Here we are down to 50 yards. We've got two rounds touching basically and one round an inch away. It's going to be pretty typical of what you can expect here at 50 yards, about a one inch grouping. As we push this back to 200, I expect it to open up to about two, two and a half inches. Uh, I'm not putting a magnified optic on it today. I just basically want to show you it is shooting as expected. So we're actually at about 94 yards right now, 93, 94 yards. Given the range is still under construction, there are some different locations of berms. Not everything's been formed up as you could, uh, as you could probably tell in some of the other shots here today. Uh, <laughs> safely, about 93 yards is all we're gonna get at this angle where we're shooting today. So instead of 100, I apologize. It's for clarity's sake, we're about 93 yards. Call it 93. So here we are at 100 yards. I've got two rounds here that are basically one inch apart. And I believe the third round is gonna be one of these two, which would give us a little over two, probably closer to two and a half inches here on our grouping. So what I'm gonna do is adjust the windage a little bit on my red dot, fire a few more rounds, 
come back here and take another look at this target and see if we can't get uh, a little more definitive group. So we're back at 93 yards. I made my adjustment, hopefully for windage properly. Fire another uh, four rounds I got left in the magazine here and see how those print out. Perhaps that was only three. So here we are downrange from 93 yards. We got one, two, and three. Again, we're showing that two to two and a half inch grouping here. And that's what you basically can expect out of this rifle around 100 yards. One of the big questions I get asked about the ARX 100 is what magazines will it take and which ones won't it? So today, I'll do a little demonstration here for you with several of them. This is the magazine it ships with. It's a steel USGI magazine. It's a standard magazine, same thing goes for the aluminum ones. They go in, they lock in easily. They drop free every time, locks the bolt back every time. I haven't had an issue with any of these style magazines yet. The next is the one that you've been seeing me shoot here quite a bit today. This is the Gen 1 PMAG. I like to use these Gen 1s in training at least. I took carbine class not too long ago, simply because hardly anybody ever has a Gen 1 olive drab PMAG in their kit. Makes it easy to keep control of my magazines and know uh, which ones are mine, not getting mixed up with anybody else's, aside from obviously marking them with tape or marker or whatever else you might choose. These lock back every single time. I have not had an issue with them. They drop out some of the time, not all of the time. The more time I spend with these, the more repetitions I put through them, the more they drop free. Do you remember the Gen 1s were just had a slightly little more material on them? Didn't always drop free from every rifle. Same is true in this case. This actually forces you to yank those magazines out when you're training and strip them out of the rifle as opposed to just relying on them to drop free every single time. This is a Gen 2 windowed PMAG. Seats easily. Locks open every time and every single time they do drop free for me, be they the windowed version like this one or the standard Gen 2s that aren't windowed. Next up, we have a hex mag. It's a 30 round hex mag magazine. This magazine's always failed uh, function flawlessly in this rifle. It's always dropped free every single time, locked the bolt back home. I have not had a problem with these. And to tell you the truth, I'm actually starting to take a little bit of a shine to these hex mags. Next up, we have a magazine that's kind of hit or miss with this rifle. This is a Mag 17, looks familiar. This is the magazine they used to ship with the Tavor. I wanted to pick it up probably around a dozen of these several months back, simply because they match the color of my uh, Tavor pretty well. This has a tendency not to pick up that round on the right side. So we're gonna see if it does it again this time. Yep. So we'll show you here what we've got. What happens is it just goes right over the top of that round every single time. Or it winds up starting to do like it is there and it just barely starts pushing it. And it winds up starting to half feed a magazine in and stove pipe it. So I would definitely say the Mag 17s are out. I would not use them at all in this rifle. I haven't loaded any rounds into this. This is a Gen 3 PMAG. And I haven't because I know they do not fit. No matter how many times you smack the bottom of these, try and get them to go in, they will not go. The problem is with that over, over travel insertion stop here that Magpul put on these, they just simply won't fit no matter what you do to them unless take a Dremel to these and take that shelf down in the back. Then I hear of these fitting. I'm not gonna modify mine. I have plenty of other Gen 1s and Gen 2s I can use in this rifle, plus hex mags if I need to without having to worry about modifying any of my Gen 3s. Then obviously the 40 round Gen 3 P mag will not fit either. 
Before we get started on the disassembly, I'd just like to say thank you for bearing with me here today on the range. As you can tell, we're about halfway through the setup and design. Appreciate you still not mentioning my wife. I'm using her craft table here until we get something per more permanent set up here on the range. So, disassembly of this rifle is basically completely different from an AR. Don't let its looks fool you. Uh, there are certain key points you're going to want to pay attention to when assembling and disassembling this rifle. Otherwise, things can get a bit out of whack. So to start, make sure you're empty. And from the cl closed bolt, you begin disassembly. The safety lever, lever here, from the safe position, you actually rotate it up slightly and hold it in place in order to move on with the next step of the disassembly. So what you'll do is you'll fold the stock to the side. You don't have to lock it closed if you don't want to, but get it out of the way. I just like to lock it closed so it stays out of the way. You're gonna rotate that up, and on the back here, you're gonna push on this plate. I find the easiest way to do that is to put it down, put the barrel on the deck, push, push up on the thing, push up on the safety, I should say, while you're pushing down on the plate, and then you pull down and away. Somewhat similar to an HK style, if you remember the G3 or MP5. So what you're pushing on is this plate here. You notice it won't push unless you pl push up on the safety lever, and that will actually allow it to rotate in far enough to release this mechanism from the back of your receiver right here. The next step would be to remove your bolt and bolt carrier. To do that, notice the charging handle is on the left here. Bring it back. And there is an indentation point right here, and it's marked on the other side as well. You pull out until you hear a click on the handle, and then you rotate it inwards. Rotate it in, and it'll snap right into place. And then you can pull it out the back of the rifle. and out it comes. If you notice later, you can put this to the other side so you can charge out the left or the right. And you can actually do that on spring tension because when you pull this bolt out all the way, it locks the travel back and forth. So even under spring pressure, you can do that, stick your hand through, push it to the other side without risk of it closing on you. Next step in removal is to take this and push it forward, then rotate it 90 degrees, and then pull it right back out turns this sideways and allows it to slide out. Next is removing the bolt. Keep it in that backwards position. And you're going to give it a little series of turns here as you pull it out. You can tell there's a groove there. And that's how you remove the bolt. You can tell it's pretty dirty. I haven't cleaned it. We've got about a thousand rounds through this rifle so far between the carbine class, what I shot today, and what I shot before uh, when I initially got it sighted in before I took it to that carbine class. Removing the bar barrel is fairly simple. It has two takedown points right here, which are reminiscent of, uh, of a Glock. To tell you the truth, I guess that would be your only comparison there. That and perhaps how ugly it is if you're into that sort of thing. Once you pull that, this barrel comes right out. It's actually a little easier to do without the sling here. Let's get rid of that. And that pulls right out. And you can tell you have your short, short stroke piston that's att attached to that as well. If you look here, at this point, broken down with the barrel off of it, that would be a pretty small package if you were to put that inside a uh, backpack, let's say. Then to reassemble the rifle, you simply reverse the process. And that goes back into place fairly easily. The rest is just putting it back together. One thing to note here, 
you'll want to leave this out into the side to take the bolt in and out. And then before you put it back in, remember to return that to the center position. That actually locks this bolt inside the bolt carrier. Next, take this, make sure it's at a 90 degree angle. Push it through, turn to the side. When you turn to the side, you're gonna to wanna to make sure this edge with the lip is facing down. Otherwise, it's not going to fit into the track here in the back of the receiver. You bring it in till it lines up. And push that out. Your charging handle, click it back into place. Home it goes. Handle back into place. Remember to rotate your safety up so you can push that plate in. Locks into place. You're stock in and out. And it's ready to go. So some final thoughts on the ARX 100. As I mentioned before, this is a civilian version, semi-automatic version of the ARX 160. And as such, you see some carryovers such as this slide cover. Looks like the rail would go all the way. It doesn't, it stops right here and actually turns into a proprietary rail at this point. Now Brett at this point is making a full length rail for this if you want that would replace this, it would give you a full 1913 rail all the way down here. If you wanted to mount, for example, an angled forward grip on here, something like that, I really don't think it's necessary. This has a bit of a curve to it anyway. So I don't find that to be an issue in and of itself. Something else to note on here are these side rails. If you do take these off, there are out juts here where they mate up, if you look at that. So if you take this off, unfortunately, it will not be smooth. So that's not something I really care about on it. One of the things that I do like, as I said before, is it's ambidextrous nature. Everything on this rifle is ambidextrous and changes quickly. I showed you earlier, just with the push of a bullet tip, you can change the side it ejects on from one side to the other. And I also mentioned changing the charging handle. As you can see right here, it's on the right-hand side here. If you actually pull this back to that indica indicator point and then pull out, it will lock the bolt. You notice this is still assembled. There's still spring pressure on here, but it locks it. You can take this pivoted in, bring it out the other side into place, click it back in, and then it'll slam home. There it is. Now, you're running your charging handle on the other side. So that's pretty cool. I do like that. I like, I like the fact that sling mounting points are ambidextrous on both sides. The front one rotates back and forth. There's two here and two on the exact same side, exact same location on the other side. The downside with that is you're limited to rope sling attachment points. Now the front, that isn't really that big of a deal. You can buy rail attachments that'll mount QD right here. You can have your QD point, which for me, for the front, QD point is almost a must. Uh, that way it allows me to transition from a two point sling into a single point sling, which I really like. It allows me to transition shoulders much easy, more easily rather than taking my hand out and wearing this more as a necklace to be able to transition shoulders. Um, that's just a personal thing that I like. The back here, there's nothing you're gonna be able to do about that. You're going to have some sort of standard cloth type sling attachment for that. The good news is there's plenty of them like that. You can, do, you can worry about that. That's not that huge of, a, huge of an issue. I assume the, the Italian military just doesn't care for QD mounts. I'm not sure. Otherwise, like I said, you can lock the bolt back with your index finger from either side. Same thing with the magazine release push in here, or similar to an AR, when you have those uh, ambidextrous releases, push here and release your magazine as well. Safeties are ambidextrous also. The backup iron sights. <laughs> These things are huge. They are very clunky. They will co-witness with this Aimpoint Pro I have on here. I do not like them really at all. They work in a pinch. I am going to leave them on here for now because I really don't use backup iron sights. I only use them as backups as the name would imply. 
at some point if I wind up coming across an extra pair of Magpul backups, Troy or something like that, I'll probably wind up swapping those out just because these things don't look very well on the rifle, I don't think. There is one hold over here from this rail. They wanted a monolithic rail on top. If you look at some of the older generations, the 22 version, initially the backup iron sights were mated into this rail very similar to what you would find on some other rifles such as the Tavor where they would pop up and out. I guess in order to adapt this to it to have the monolithic rail all the way across the top they had to do that. Which brings me to my next point. There's a pin back here in my rifle that came that way from the factory. I got this a few weeks ago. That takes the slop out of the rear here so there is no movement in this rear rail. Some of the early models did not have a, a roll pin in here and that actually caused quite a bit of slop. If you do have one without the rear pin in here, contact Beretta, they will send you a pin. It's very simple to put in. You just get it started, tap it in with the, uh, use a punch, tap it in, or just the top of uh, an Allen head if you needed to, something like that. And that'll go right into place and shore that up pretty nicely. Otherwise, stock folds to the side as you've seen before. Tran translating the, the stock is pretty easy. Just pull here and you bring out your length of pull. I find that with this rifle, all the way out is just about the proper eye relief for me for the proper length of pull. It seems to do pretty well. Could almost go with the fourth position. Uh, the word is on the street that Brett is coming up with another one. You can actually just push that down. I'll see if I can do it without the tip of a bullet here. See if my finger's small enough to get in there and do that. Not quite. This will just pull right out if you push down on that with the tip of a bullet. Pretty much anything, if you can't disassemble it with your hand, the tip of a bullet will do it with this. That brings me to my final thoughts. Insofar as, is this rifle for you, do I recommend the ARX 100? I like having the ARX 100 in my arsenal, honestly. I like having one in the safe. It is a cool rifle. It's a nice collector piece. It's been reliable in the about thousand rounds I put through it and I ran it pretty hard in the carbine class. There were five back to back to back to back to back malfunctions that were related to the gas setting. I changed the gas setting and it ran like a top after that. So I do need to point those five out. Other than that, those are the only five malfunctions back to back to back. Again, more related to on the side of user error for the ammo that I was using versus the gas setting on this rifle. Speaking of which, you can adjust the gas setting either with your hand or with the tip of a bullet. It's right here. There's a normal set, a standard setting, and it's actually getting pretty stiff right now. There we go. I don't have a bullet tip handy to turn that for me. <clears throat> Between normal and standard, I did that earlier as I was taking it out and <clears throat> showing you the breakdown on the uh, video, I believe. So there you go. Generally speaking, though, with most ammo, you can almost run it in either position. It's really not going to matter. Uh, although if I had the choice and I needed to, as from a reliability standpoint, I just run it wide open. It's pro it's not going to hurt anything with the 223 ammo unless you're running something really crazy exotic. The barrel twist on this is a one in seven, which means it should handle some of those heavier uh, loads a little better. Uh, one in seven, one in nine. That's personal preference. I've gotten into that in some blogs that I've written, uh, be it over on the Bank Switch or at uh, 13cgunreviews.com. Six one way, half a dozen the other. Just depends on what you're mostly shooting. For the most part, I run 55 and 62 grain through all my rifles, so it's not really going to make that big of a difference for me. Should you buy it? If you're just starting out and there are other rifles that you need, this would be low on my totem pole of rifles to buy. Don't get me wrong, I like it. It's a fun rifle and I've enjoyed using it and working with it and I'm really glad I have it in my arsenal. But there are several other rifles I would recommend before picking this one up. Now if you are looking for something different, you don't want you know a third or fourth or fifth AR sitting in your safe and you want something a little different at its current price point I picked mine up for 1200 bucks uh, even and you'll you search the net right now as this video goes live there are several places that do have them for sale at that price point for 1200 bucks it's a nice rifle and it's a pretty cool piece to have in your collection at its MSRP I believe is 1950 I 
probably would not have bought one at that price point. That's one of the reasons why I waited, as you guys know. I did spend some time with this, one of the T&E guns of these earlier in the year, and I, I, just, I just didn't see it for that price point. Uh, some other things to note here. Uh, trigger is about 10 and a half pounds out of the box. I would say that trigger works down to closer to about 10 pounds once you work it in. Uh, when I first got the trigger and just like, well, the first time I got my hands on one of the T&E guns, it had some rounds through it, so it was broken in a little better. Trigger on this will break in. You'll lose at least half to three quarters of a pound on it. It will become a little crisper. It is not a great trigger by any means. For what it is, a factory trigger for what's meant to be a frontline carbine, so to speak. It's not bad. It's just not what I would like. Uh, eventually going forward, I'd love to see a company like Geisley or uh, some of the other ones out there make a drop and trigger pack or some sort of upgrade for the trigger on this. That said, as far as the safety is concerned, ease of going on and off and the trigger, once I got ha about halfway through that carbine class, the trigger got a lot better and so did the safety. You know, how many times during a carbine class are you working that safety on and off? As you can see here, it's coming on and off pretty easily. Uh, at this point, it did take some time to break in to get comfortable with that. I think the Aimpoint Pro is a pretty good choice to put on here. I'm not sure exactly what optic will settle on here in the long run, but for now, this did, seems to be a good choice. If you have any questions about this, anything else here on the channel, please feel free to reach out to us, facebook.com forward slash gun reviews. Obviously here on YouTube is a great spot. It is hard to see those comments all the time, to unflag them for spam, it happens all the time on gun channels. So Facebook is probably a great place to find us at and to ask your questions there. Uh, Instagram, we have a lot of fun on Instagram. You'll see a lot of behind the scenes pictures and things like that that you won't find really anywhere else as well as the main 13C website, 13cgunreviews.com, or you can use the shorter uh, link, 13c.us. Thanks again, everyone. I really appreciate you tuning in, and we'll see you again next time.